think about the profound influence of the Bible on the world, the way that it has shaped our culture, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, it's probably a good idea that you know at least what it says. It's going to be about us taking and reading the Bible. All right, welcome to the Take and Read podcast. Pastor Chad here, and with me, I have Linnea Morris. Hey, guys. How are you? Good, doing well. Good, good, good. We are continuing our journey through the book of Acts, and uh, you've been on this journey several times. Yeah. Like three, maybe four times? I think three, okay. yeah. Now, are you one of those uh, guests on the podcast that keeps up with the podcast so you kind of know where we might be? I, I do, but I know sometimes you record ahead, so it's possible that I might be a little off, but I do know we're still in the book of Acts. You are right. We so. are still in the books, and and we will probably be in the book of Acts for... A long time. Uh, yeah. Long You're over time. halfway, though. Yeah. We're, That's good. We are over. Yeah. This is... It is good. So, um, kind of paint for me a picture of what the Lord's teaching in these days. What's he showing you? Uh, Good question. I have been sick the past couple of weeks. I don't get sick very often, but when I do, I think it hits me hard. So I've been at home a lot reading, uh, and I'm reading right now through the book, The Hiding Place, uh, the story about Cory Ten Boom, and I've read it before. Good book. It's been a while though. Uh, but right now what's sticking out to me is how uh, Cory is going through this. She's experiencing and telling the realization of how God is using her in such an unlikely place even though she feels inadequate sometimes, she doesn't feel like she's, she's skilled enough or knows enough, but you watch her start to depend on the Lord and on His Word so much in just like an extreme way mm. that I can't even fathom. But thinking back to myself, like what does that look like for me as a mom who works at a church, um, a member of the community, I feel inadequate. And I've said this before in the, in the podcast, it's just something that the Lord is continuing to uh, teach me is that God uses unlikely people. And it is it is just so encouraging to know that God can use us, even though we're not the best of the best. Hmm. Um, but it's all about having a humble heart and being surrendered to that. So I, I'm just trying to ask the Lord every day, you know, how do you wanna use me? How am I supposed to help advance the kingdom? If that means, you know, removing pride and becoming not this person of power that I want to be or making mm. my name great, but what is that supposed to look like? So you're coming to this understanding that God can use anyone, but he doesn't use everyone. Yeah, yeah. And so the if you had to distill down what are some of the traits that you see, whether it's in Corey Ten Boom's life or as you read the scriptures, what criteria exists for those he does use uh, yeah i was just reading in psalm last week uh in the verse about a, a humble and contrite heart and that has just been going over and over in my head it's not skill it's about how if you can surrender yourself and be humble and not resist what god has for you mm. that's that's when he's going to use you love it yeah. love it and we see that, I think, throughout the scriptures. We see that in the book of Acts, for sure. I think you see different characters that we encounter throughout the kind of early years of the church, and there are some that that will kind of pretend to be a part of the way, you know, this group of, of Christians, those Christ followers, and others that are doing it for personal selfish gain. And so you'll see different characters throughout, but then you'll see this this general stream of faithful followers that out of humility and giving credit to God and not claiming power for themselves are continue to use, be used by God. So, yeah. and I think we'll even see that today. We're still in chapter 16 and uh, we are going to be jumping into just another small snippet. We've been kind of doing these small little sections of scripture. And so we saw a couple of episodes ago where Paul uh, you know, meets Timothy, and then we see Paul and Barnabas part ways. We see conflict between friends. 
but the mission goes forward and the way that God uses you know that that splitting of these two to create two missionary groups that will go in different directions uh, and then we see last week where Paul um, you know gets this vision to go on to Macedonia and go that way and we see this interesting reality of the Holy Spirit stopping him and stopping them from going into Asia and you know if you were to look on the map you kind of see he kind of circumnavigated around Asia and then God gives a vision that he's supposed to go the exact opposite direction of Asia to Macedonia and that the Lord has has him going there so we kind of move into this next section and this is after Paul has received that vision uh, to go to Macedonia and they had concluded that God had called them to preach the gospel there so they set sail and we get to now see some of these adventures so we'll be in Acts 16 and we're just going to hang out in verses 11 through 15 and we'll talk about it uh, before we jumped on this podcast Lene and I spent some time praying asking the Lord to give us wisdom and guidance I think that's a necessary element because the spirit we're told by Christ himself that he has given us his spirit and his spirit will bring uh, insight and understanding into all that he has taught. And so that's why we do that. Here we go. We're setting out in verse 11 of chapter 16. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay and she prevailed upon us okay so kind of from the context here we have paul immediately responding to a dream a vision in a dream to go to macedonia so they set sail he's convinced that they're called to preach the gospel so they go he would give a little we get a little insight and he went to this place and then this place and this place but then they ended up in kind of a a primary city within Macedonia. So they're in Macedonia. So we see he's been called there, they get there, and they go. And so what are some things that you observe just about their arrival and kind of how they go about doing things? Who's there? What's happening? Uh, yeah, you definitely have some fun names, some different places uh, that we don't normally see. Right. Um, then you see that they, on the Sabbath day, uh, they're going somewhere where they're going to go pray. Uh, which is probably like a weekly mm -hmm. uh, something that they do. Uh, and then they sit down and speak to the women who are there. Yeah, so you get the sense that there's still some very Jewish traditional habits, weekly rhythms of going somewhere on the Sabbath and meeting with a group of people that love God mm -hmm. and pray. And so that's you see this kind of tendency in Paul to go to these locations on the Sabbath day to teach, to pray, and so something similar. We don't know, um, I mean, I don't have a bunch of study notes in front of me to say why would they have to go outside of the city mm -hmm. to this kind of riverside, learning that there was maybe this gathering that would occur that was maybe not supposed to happen. You don't get a sense of if it's legal or illegal or prohibited, but they've caught word that there's this gathering of believers that meet for prayer on the Sabbath and so they're going to go and try to find them and talk with them. So you see kind of this strategy of Paul's to go find people that are somewhat sensitive to the Lord and worship him already to then give further revelation of who Christ is. So there's this gathering of faithful women. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got Lydia, uh, the seller of purple goods. I think that the indication there, and I don't have a footnote in mind that gives indication i think i've read before that the idea of purple garments or dyed garments like that was a pretty high-end uh commodity yeah and so it would have been reasonable that this that lydia would have been of means or had some sort of mon money or funds or something like that so 
probably someone of influence if she's, you know, dealing with noble households and, and selling them their their cloth for fancy garments, things like that. So just gives you an indication of her. She's probably a woman of means. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a worshiper of God. Yep. Which is another aspect of it. But then the part that is interesting to me, uh, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention uh, to what was said by Paul. Yes. So... You take that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there throughout Acts, you'll see multiple times where clearly the Lord is indicating through Luke as he's describing this, because he has every intention to communicate clearly so that Theophilus, who is the recipient of this account, will have understanding and clarity and certainty in all that he's come to believe and what he's been taught. And there are times where Paul will go into a region and it'll say, as many who were appointed to eternal life believed. Or a statement like this that we may glaze over, and it will say here that the Lord opened her heart, which implies there are times when the Lord doesn't open somebody's heart. And that begs a very big question mm -hmm. that I think is can be deeply and hotly debated that calls into question the nature of salvation and who is saved and to what extent you know God's activity in the salvation process and so this clearly indicates that in this time God chose to open her heart but it also indicates that she had to respond mm -hmm. that she receives an open heart that is a sovereign act of God, that he chose her heart to be open, which indicates there are times when he doesn't open people's hearts to receive. But then there still seems to be this sense of responsibility and her faithfulness to respond mm -hmm. to an open heart. And so she says, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, like she's saying, I, I, I want to be faithful. She is intending and desiring and willing to be faithful to him. And so there is this happy tension, what I would say is a paradox in Scripture, not a contradiction, that there is this paradox or this tension that's created between God's activity and our response within that salvation experience. And here we have Lydia is, her heart is open and she responds with an open heart. So now she can receive, she can understand who Christ is, and then she can respond to that. And I think there are some people that would, you know, try to kind of classify this predestining of God and the sovereign hand of God opening hearts. Uh, we see him kind of move and, and open and close Pharaoh's heart at mm -hmm. different times in history. And there's a temptation to say, well, then if God's doing it, then what responsibility do we have? And then there's another view that says God doesn't do it. We have all the responsibility to choose or not choose, and so it's, it's all on us. And I think both extremes kind of miss some of that tension that's yep. necessarily in there. There's a paradox of God moving, but us responding. And we're going to give an account. We're gonna stand before the judgment. And if we're micromanaged and, and hyper-determined in all of our activities, and there's not a lot we can say mm -hmm. in that judgment. And so it seems like a moot point, but clearly there's a judgment where we're gonna give a, a response for what we did in the body and outside of the body. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about this judgment that we as believers will also face and have to give an account for how we lived our life given the knowledge we had. But here it says our ability to even first receive and understand who God is mm -hmm. and who Christ is is a sovereign act of God. Yep. I don't know how you can get around yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's <clears throat> definitely a tough a, a tough point for a lot of people. For me, I I mean I'm just I'm going to keep going back to that idea that God uses us. So God is opening her heart so that she can pay attention. But it also goes back to Paul who was sharing the message. It doesn't say he opened everyone's heart. Mhm. Mm so that almost gives some freedom to us when we share about Christ. We know it's not 100% up to us. Mm. I mean, we we need to be willing 
and share God as best as we can, but to understand that the response is not based on how well we performed Mm -hmm. or how well we explained it. And so there's a freedom of, I'm just going to be willing. And if something happens, praise God. But if it doesn't, praise God. Like we Mm -hmm. were still obedient. And that for me as someone who I, I'm a perfectionist, I want things done well. If I put work towards it, I want it to be successful. But to know that it's not always going to be like that, it's so freeing mm. for that. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, I think that you know people have some tension with that because it's not just an intellectual theological truth, but there's, a, there's an emotional reality that in our life we know people that have rejected God. Mm -hmm. We know people that we have shared Christ with and they're just not receptive at all. And so we can plead and pray and entreat the Lord, please open their hearts, open their hearts. And I think that's a a good prayer. Um, Kind of like the, you know, the times we see the persistent widow appealing to the Lord and just kind of, you know, that that parable of the, the master who just, or the judge who finally gets so annoyed (laughs) <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, somebody who gets so annoyed with, you know, the way in which God does or doesn't move or... Yeah, and so I think that there's a a burden for prayer here, Mm -hmm. praying for God to move on people's hearts, to open their hearts so that they can see who Christ is. And yeah, I think that tension's real, and it's emotional. It's not just intellectual. And I think that there it also leaves room for that willful response to the gospel, that Mm -hmm. somebody who the gospel's been laid out, they have no issue seeing the historical nature of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and yet don't want anything to do with him. They're like, no, nah, that's not for me. And and to ha- that their their hearts may be been open, but they have not been receptive. And mm. I know that there 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 will be some people that take issue with that. That you know you have um, certain theological streams that that see that man when Christ is presented, who could resist? And I just think you see evidences, you know, throughout Scripture where there are people that reject the lord mm-hmm. and you and so there's that interesting paradox and, yeah. and tension with god can sovereignly move and does clearly but then there's also a responsibility on us in the way that we respond to that open-hearted experience and and seeing him for who he really yeah. is i don't know where i heard this but recently i heard um back about the the responsibility it's not on us for people to receive because even Jesus Christ, who would be the the best person to share the good news, it wasn't a hundred percent acceptance rate. So even even the best of the best, the perfect person to share, it's not a hundred percent approval rate, or you know, it's it's not going to happen. And it's it's because we have some of that responsibility. Yeah. yeah. And I think, too, that, yeah, there are people that may not like the reality that God is glorified when he is just, and but that's a reality, that there is a God is glorified in both his act of mercy mm-hmm. and his act of justice. Mm-hmm. And that's why Paul says that he can be both the just and the justifier, that mm-hmm. that he he remains just and and he will he will give the perfect response to those who have rejected the opportunity to know Christ. Mm-hmm. And he will also be gracious in a way that, you know, when people maybe have died without hearing the gospel or uh, infants who pass away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would even say those those souls that have been aborted, you know, that there is a clear, loving, and just God who mm-hmm. will deal perfectly with every one of these crazy scenarios we can experience, see, or think up. So, um, yeah, pretty heavy. Yeah. Dense little. Wow, few verses. I mean, you jumped right to, you know, that one verse. Oh, that's come like, on. Okay. <laughs> um, 
is you see here too that it makes a reference in verse 15 after she was baptized. So you see the immediate response to coming to faith. So her heart is opened yep. uh, to understand uh, the Lord. And Paul faithfully preaches, and then she believes, and so she she places faith in Christ is what is implied here, because she's a worshiper of God, uh, so probably Jewish, and if that's where they're gathered for the Sabbath and they're praying, and so there's a lot of indications here. And then uh, you see that she responds, and she wants to be baptized. So the first act of obedience uh, to following Christ is here again, baptism also says, and her household as well. And so we don't know the makeup of her household. There will be some that will contend that infant baptism is supported by this passage, but there's no indication that anyone in her household is an infant. Uh, we just know that there are others who uh, respond to this message of the gospel, and it's in response to that that they are then baptized. And so then she wants to open her home for fellowship to these believers. So they Clearly, at this point, they're all down by the, the riverside, and they're out there doing their prayer thing, and then she wants to be hospitable and invite them because now they're a part of this community of believers, this thing called the church. Mm -hmm. And so right away, they want she wants to host them in their home, and they begin to have this fellowship with each other because of their, their unifying bond in Christ. It's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So you look at a passage like this uh, that's got a lot of different things. I mean, it's uh, very few short verses. There's a lot densely packed in there. But what kind of what are the takeaways? What do you walk away with and go, okay, I need to live in light of this truth. This is it's something, it shows me something about myself or about God, about the way he works, about my involvement uh, with believers. Like, what do you see here? Yeah, this is what I love about being on the podcast is I would read this by myself at home and just read through it and go on with my day. But when we spend time to study it and talk about it, I mean, I've, I've got two things and I would have just glazed <laughs> over it. So the first is that um, in verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention. Uh, I would just, that's my prayer for myself. Hmm. Uh, that's my prayer for my two kids, uh, that as we parent our children, uh, it's like we don't know what, what their lives are gonna look like in the future but just we know that we can pray for them on a continual basis. We can fast about it, we can pray about it. Uh, so that is like, I mean, that's gonna be my prayer focus all week probably, just thinking about them. Uh, and then I think the second thing is, Lydia did not know that these guys were gonna come to her house, mm. but she had this great moment of accepting Christ she was baptized, and then she was like, all right, let's come to my house. And she, like, who knows what state her house was in? <laughs> but like me, I I would be that is a second point. guessing, you know, oh shoot, did I put the laundry away? Are the dishes like all over? What's the smell of mm, the day? Mm. Uh, but that just the community was so important, especially after something that was that powerful, mm -hmm. uh, that she was willing to say, okay, everyone come to my house, which I mean, cultural, you know, culture was a little bit different back then, but. I want to be willing and able to to open my house to people mm -hmm. for that community aspect. Yeah, are you available to what the Lord might do in your day? Exactly. And are you in a place where you could have people over or give of yourself or you know, how, how, what might he call upon you to do and provide for other believers? I mean, there's a ton there. So Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I think like you the the end of verse 14 that is probably something I mean I that is something that I pray every weekend as we go into a court time of corporate worship and I'm called upon to preach that the Lord would do a supernatural work of opening hearts so that what he has has brought me through in that week and my time in his word that that I would be ready to say what he wants me to say and that people would be in a place where he has opened their heart to receive, not just unbelievers, but also believers. And so it just, I think it reinforces the reality that this, what what they encountered, that was a supernatural event because God was working in the hearts of people to open their hearts to see and understand. And I pray for the same supernatural event every weekend when we gather as a church. 
mm. that he would be doing the work that only he can do in people's hearts. And regardless of what distractions they come in with, that he would do a supernatural, miraculous work to draw people's hearts, to focus their attention on what he wants to say. And I think we can do a lot to prepare ourselves for that yep, and minimize the distractions and really work to focus our attention. But I think there's also the reality that he can, and that's what they were. They had gathered to pray. yep. So they were focused and seeking the Lord. And so then he, because they're in that place, he then does the supernatural work to open their heart. So, uh, and I also think that that idea of hospitality and being willing to open your household or whatever metaphorically that means for you. What What is it that you mm-hmm. would be, if called upon, would be not ready to share with those in need, uh, whether it's your car or your stuff or your house or your time? Yep. Like, are we ready at the drop of a hat to then provide whatever the Lord calls us to provide for the people of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super cool. You Uh, see humility, you see availability, you see response, you see, uh, yeah, readiness. There's so many cool things. And there may have been a lot of questions provoked Mm -hmm. by what is said, uh, especially when we think about the paradox uh, that, that exists, that God sovereignly moves. And yet we, we are also able to respond and I don't know how all that works because I know the arguments that say, well, you know, if you know, you have the 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 reform tradition, the very strong Calvinist tradition that says God is sovereign, He predestines, and I think those are true things. I think those are true statements. We see them in Ephesians and elsewhere that God predestines, He foreknows. He, there's all these things in which clearly the God of the Bible is capable of and does. But there's also this ongoing sense of our response and owning our our response to the truth and that we're on the hook for some of this. And I think you can't remove the human responsibility in this and individual responsibility. So powerful, crazy. It's so good. good. <laughs> so if, if any questions have been provoked by things that we've talked about today on the podcast, please email me at takeandreadpodcast at gmail.com. You can leave comments in the comment section. That's a great place for this community of take and read Bible readers uh, to engage and converse and share thoughts and ideas. And yeah, continue to share this podcast with people that you think might benefit from taking a little bit slower walk through the scriptures and hearing two people talk about it. Um, You've witnessed two people that have encountered the risen Christ who have been changed by him forever. We believe this word to be the true word and inspired word communicated by God himself and that it is profitable for us and that it gives us insight in how we're to live a flourishing and vibrant life. So if, uh, yeah, if you share it, then more people we believe will, will come to experience that vibrant and flourishing life in Christ. And so that's the goal here, not to make a name for ourselves, but to make his name known and for more people to walk faithfully with him. So With all that said, thanks again for joining me, Linnea. Thanks for being on the podcast. I enjoyed it. It was short, but super, super good, super dense, and just a great conversation overall. So thank you, and everyone out there, go take and read the Word of God. Blessings. Blessings.